This is Alan Karpik on goldenblack.com with our Saturday simulcast. Uh, Brian Newbert will join us for the first segment. And we'll talk a little bit of what goes on a lot in the summer, which obviously is basketball, uh, not only recruiting, but uh, camps, uh, tournaments, et cetera. And we'll get uh, caught up a little bit on that and where Brian will be headed throughout the month of July or in the month of July as well. And maybe I'll start with that, Brian, with you and just... Um, Next week, uh, being the, well, the 4th or the 5th of July, you'll be heading uh, to the southeast to, to uh, watch watch some basketball as you have over the years. Tell us a little bit about what, what you expect to see and what guys you'll be most keeping an eye on at this point. Is, does Charlotte count as the southeast? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think so. Are you sure? That's... Well, okay, it's one state. Some regional I guess, I guess George is the furthest part of the southeast, but uh, I look at it down there. It's south and it's east. <laughs> but no, but uh, but you're going to Charlotte, but you're flying to Atlanta. No, I'm flying to Charlotte. Oh, you're flying to Charlotte. So okay, well, I'm, I'll, I'll try. So you're in the uh, uh, the mid south. I don't know what term we're going to use, but you're. It's in Charlotte. all just public's country, right? Yeah, yeah. That's all that matters, really. Uh, yeah. Um... So the Adidas event is in Charlotte. Uh, the Nike stuff is in Augusta. Augusta. Uh, so I'm going to go to uh, Charlotte for a couple of days. Uh, Jakari Harris, Travis Perry, EJ Walker are, are all there uh, among some other guys. Um, those would be obviously two of Purdue's 2024 targets and Travis Perry and Jakari Harris. Raleigh Burgess, who committed to Purdue some time ago, uh, is back in action now after breaking his leg during the high school season. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't expect to see his very best because I'm sure there's some rust going on there, but he will be playing. Uh, so uh, this is my chance to see him play again. Uh, and then in Augusta, um, Cannon Catchings and Trent Sisley, uh, will be playing as well as uh, Trent Burns, who uh, obviously pretty just offered and hosted for an official visit. So between that little uh, two and a half hour uh, jaunt, that's the majority of Purdue's uh, next couple of recruiting boards. The Under Armour thing is in Atlanta. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna mess with that. That's a little bit. Uh, I've made that drive way too many times and probably wasn't particularly smart doing it, uh, doing it in the middle of the night and stuff like that. So <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm just going to stick between Charlotte and, uh, and uh, Augusta and all publics in between. <laughs> and by publics, what, what, what I do, cause I do see it on the expense account type. What do you like at Publix? I'm just, I'm just going to throw out, throw this off. What is your, is it the sandwiches? Is it what, well, what is it, what is it good about Publix? And then we'll get back to basketball. I don't know what the science is behind it other than the <laughs> boar head. They yeah. use boar's head uh, cold cuts, but their sandwiches are really good. And yeah. their, their fruit is really good. All of their food is just really, really good. And uh The Orlando Sentinel on April Fool's Day uh, published an article saying that Subway was moving into all of the publics in Florida, <laughs> and it, it was like their most responded to story ever. Yeah, because, because people <laughs> were outraged. Um, it was pretty funny, um, but no, it's it's uh, the first time I went to Atlanta. Uh, I, I was told in no uncertain terms that I needed to go to Publix for yeah. lunch. So I sought one out. I got a sandwich. It was a really good sandwich. Uh, and ever since then, I have radicalized my family uh, <laughs> into the public's cult. And every time we drive to the southeast to go to Florida or whatever, or, or Tennessee or whatever it might be, we uh, end up eating at Publix all the time, too, because my wife and uh, daughter uh, now outrank me in the cult. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it's just... It's just good quality food, and it's it's way better than you'd get at any fast food place. Obviously, right. um, yeah. I, I don't know why every supermarket in the country can't can't do the exact same thing, but um, perhaps it's just what you put your emphasis on. 
All right. To be clear, Publix is not a sponsor of this simulcast, uh, Saturday simulcast. But they... we're always fielding calls for new sponsors. You bet so we are. And I have it. I, 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 it's twenty four seven on that statement. But we do want to thank the Union Club Hotel, who I'm sure like Publix as well. When their staff, Vicky Wicks and their staff travels, and we appreciate the Union Club and the Boiler Up Bar. Uh, as of right now, there is no Publix as part of that, but. All right, Brian, you, you've been intrigued. I know Jakari Harris uh, uh, on down the line. I mean, all these, not all of these guys, but many of these guys are right there for Purdue in terms of what when their decisions are going to be. But talk about uh, just, uh, you know, re refresh our folks about what you like about Harris as a player and what you are may looking to see when, when you get a chance to see him play uh, a year old, a year later, a year or so later. Well, yeah, I can answer that question a lot better next week, but, yeah. uh, or in two weeks, but um, no, he, he's just a tough physical guy who I think, uh, you know, can play three positions, can guard a lot of different positions. And, uh, you know, I think Purdue with its personnel here with some of the, some of the wings they have in the program right now are, is becoming more interchangeable. Uh, I, I think that stuff nowadays really matters defensively. Um, but I think he's a real competitor. Uh, he's big and strong. Um, everything I've always seen of him as a shooter is, uh, impressive. I mean, he, he does a good job shooting the basketball. Uh, I think when you look at a guy who plays in suburban Atlanta, um, the guys he plays against are no joke. Uh, the talent yeah. level down there is extraordinary. Uh, you could just look at like the all state team down there. And a lot of those guys are in that same, in, in that same sphere that Grayson high school plays in. And uh, he's playing against college bodies. He's playing against physical guys. He's playing against, strength uh and talent and um i just think he's a competitor more than anything else that showed up in aau last year when i saw him um for the first time and uh i think that's a big part of what purdue likes about him i think he can you know he he can play point guard if needed i don't know if he's a true point guard he's more of a combo guard but i think that's the way the game's going anyway yeah uh, as long as you can make shots and guard i just think he's a lot of a lot of what Purdue needs right now from a mentality perspective, they need a, uh, they could stand to get a, you know, just a cutthroat dude who is going to compete and it is going to beat you up defensively. And um, he's kind of like, a, I've always compared him to kind of like a Keaton Grant 2.0 where, uh, you know, I, I, I think he's, he, he, his size and physicality and defensive demeanor, I think really stand out and um, I think he's probably a better shooter now than Keaton Grant was at the same stage. Keaton Grant became a pretty good shooter. Um, but I, I think Jakari Harris is probably better uh, at this stage of his career than Keaton Grant was. Yeah. And Jakari Harris, of course, uh, has a, a famous Purdue alum and famous basketball player as a dad in Glenn Robinson. Maybe some of that competitiveness there and pretty is wearing off. You've talked about to him a lot over the last year. That uh, be interesting to see where he lands and how quickly he makes his decision. You well, last weekend we're in Indianapolis or in Westfield Carmel and saw Cannon Catchings in in, in addition to Jack Benner. Talk about Catchings, who has been a man on the road to say the least uh, with his basketball of late. Uh, even uh, you wrote a little bit about him being uh, quote unquote, I'm exhausted, but to talk about where he, where he is from your perspective, uh, obviously a huge get for Matt Painter and company when uh, signing day comes up but talk about uh, how you see him so far and what to, again, I don't know that he has anything more to prove as a player, but uh, still always interesting to watch his game. Yeah, no, he's a really talented guy. Obviously I, I think he's worthy uh, of his rankings. Uh, you know, things like that. I think he'd have had a ton of offers if he didn't, you know, commit to Purdue so quickly. Uh, I, I just think a lot of these experiences he's going through now are new. You know, he wasn't one of those guys who was a known guy as an eighth grader uh, and all of that stuff. And uh, I think all that comes with being the level of player that he's that he's proven himself to be, I think, has 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 come really hard and fast here. And you know, he gets off a plane from California a couple weeks ago, yeah. uh, 
comes to Purdue's team camp. Uh, and then he goes out to Colorado Springs for USA basketball. And then he comes back and he plays at Charlie Hughes this weekend with his high school. Uh, and then he gets right back on a plane and he's at NBA camp now in Orlando. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast when you're that good and you're, you're that highly regarded. And I, I, I think that we lose sight too often um, in the summers uh, when kids don't necessarily play great in terms of what kind of what kind of demands are being put on them i mean they're playing a ton of basketball yeah. in a very short period of time he's going to come back from the nba camp in orlando and he's going to come home and then he's going to i assume he's going to come home and then he's going to fly right back to georgia to play in the uh those events in augusta uh so that that's a lot of basketball yeah yeah um, for, for a player who again is not used to this this endless junket of, of, of all-star events and, 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 you know, uh, prominent tournaments and things like that. Jump shot's been a little bit up and down here, uh, from what I've seen both at Purdue's team camp and at the Charlie Hughes shootout this weekend, uh, still gets his number, still finds a way to score, still is a real problem for, for, for people to stop, still does some things that you just don't see in players very often, uh, in terms of height, length, athleticism, his pull-up jumper is, as good as I've seen from a player with those physical gifts, at least at Purdue. Um, he'll be fine. He's just, uh, um, I think he's a little bit weary in the legs. His, he has uh, laid out a couple of events um, to kind of rest his body a little bit here. I think that's probably, a, that probably tells you what you need to know about where uh, he is from a physical perspective. Um, but he's a uh, he's a really good player. It's uh, the thing for him in terms of his long term success is uh, I think he's going to have to you know kind of keep maturing and things like that. And uh, I think that that's the case with ninety percent of players. Um, I think his poise and you know kind of things like that are are going to come into focus as he gets up to higher and higher levels of basketball, but he's certainly going through a lot of very valuable experiences right now. Yeah. And a great chance to uh, at least know what it's like to have to have to perform at a high level. He's, he's getting more and more used to that. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense from that standpoint, who else, anybody else on that, that this past week, I mean, Jack Benner, you've had talked a lot about him and had, had a couple of big games, but what, I mean, I mean, my question for you on him, you've seen him so many times, what, continues to him what impresses you most about him and where do you think uh, you know we've talked about his shooting ability but uh, what do you think he's going to bring to the table as he continues to evolve as a player by the time he gets to West Lafayette yeah he had a really good weekend uh I think yeah. he had a uh um I, I don't want to overstate this and I I, I don't want to put outsized importance on June basketball but Understood. I think that you know he, he looked like a Mr. Basketball candidate uh this weekend he's got a really good team around him too I, I think that's important but I think you know at the very least I think he's a guy who is going to be a good offensive piece for them he he does a lot of things Purdue puts more value on than other people do uh he passes he thinks the game he, he's an excellent passer he's a he's a skilled offensive guy with a high IQ he can handle the ball he can play away from the ball he uh can I I don't want to say he can necessarily roast any matchup he draws but he, at the high school level um he can drive past bigger people he can post up smaller people and his physicality as as a post up offensive player really really stands out um and now how, how that translates I don't know because you know come the big 10 uh how often you're going to have a 5 foot 8 guy from uh scottsburg indiana guarding you uh <laughs> it's yeah it that's probably not going to happen very often but um it does speak a little bit to his demeanor it does speak to his basketball versatility um i think his shot's been a little bit up and down uh this spring and summer uh but, but he's a very capable shooter he's a very capable pull-up shooter um he just has a ha has a really well-rounded offensive game and a little bit of an edge of toughness that you don't see very often from that basketball category. Um, 
I think he's uh, I think he's a competitor. I, I think he'll be less of a defensive liability uh, than a lot of guys of that category that Purdue's had. Uh, it's it's been a real struggle for some of those guys. Uh, they get targeted and it switches quite a bit. I think he'll. I don't think he'll quite be the the target some of those other guys have been. But um, I think what really stands out too is you know he's got shooters all around him on that team. Uh, they're going to make some noise this year. Uh, yeah, that is a really good team, and he makes everybody around him better. He plays for other people. Uh, when he gets the ball in the post, he makes the right passes. When he gets the ball at the in the high post, he he does a good job spraying the ball out to shooters around him. He just makes people better, and uh, that's at that level of high school basketball. That's when your best player and one of the best players in the state is doing that, that, that really bodes well. And that really speaks volumes about what kind of offensive player they are. Now, I don't think he's going to come to Purdue and be Dakota Mathias. You know, I think that's the best comparison I can give him from a skills perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say he's that good. I don't want to say he's that level shooter, but I think at minimum, he'll be a good offensive kind of connective piece. Uh, and those guys have been really successful at Purdue, and they have really helped Purdue be really successful with them. And I, I, I think he's a good culture guy. I think he's a good system guy. I don't think he's going to come to Purdue, and they're going to need a hell of a lot from him right away. Uh, I think time will be on their side there, um, given what they should have in the program at the time. Um, but I think he can be a good piece for Purdue offensively kind of moving forward. Um, and I can't remember what else you asked because I that's all I, I that's all I asked about that him. question as I always well, do. All right, Trent Burns though is a guy you're going to get a chance to see. I'm assuming for the first time. I you know uh, seven foot one uh, out of uh, Houston, Texas, and a recent Purdue offer and a recent Purdue visit. Uh, what do you know about him? And what again when you're looking at him? Uh, he's not um, he's seven one. And I think he barely barely tips the scales at two hundred pounds at this point. Even if he does. Uh, but what intrigues you about that? I hope you're not getting this little pop up uh, on our recording. No. Um, applications on my Mac want me to close out so I can update the the app. Uh, Do that later. <laughs> well, it won't take no for an answer. It keeps popping yeah. back up. Uh, no, Trent Burns. You, you yeah. know, the reason I go to so many of these events is so I can know what I'm talking about when stuff like this happens, and when they just offer a guy sight unseen, that is my, you know, that is my worst case scenario, but uh, I yeah. have no idea. Um, yeah. I know he's really tall. I know people say, Oh, he's really tall. He, he must go to Purdue or he must be going to Purdue. He's not that kind of big guy. He's not Zach Eady or Isaac Haas or Caleb Swanigan. He's not one of those redwoods that Purdue has kind of uh, come to be known for. He's more of a, He's a skinnier, uh, kind of more perimeter gifted sort of guy. Uh, you know, Purdue's had some of those too, uh, and been successful with them. So it's not necessarily you have to have the the Titanic center that you can put two feet from the rim and just plow people and then and then play off of that. Um, but he's more of a he's more of an outside guy. He's more of a perimeter guy. He's more of a, a ball screen dive guy. I assume. Um, but he's a, a, a guy people are only now really finding out about. How that happens nowadays, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think with big guys, sometimes they grow. Sometimes they're not very good when they're younger and the light just comes on. I think that's probably the case here. Uh, he is a, a very academic, motivated young man from what I understand. And I think Purdue uh, speaks to him that way. Uh, but if he plays well in July, this is going to be a situation where he probably gets uh, a bunch of offers just off the peach jam alone. If he plays well down there, because all you have to do as a big guy at the peach jam is put one foot for the other and not fall over. And uh, you have every college coach in the country sitting there. And now I say that, but I, I need to couch that in the, in, in, in the modern reality that, I think college coaches are putting less time into high school recruiting than they used to. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, because when push comes to shove at decision time, 
you know, who was there in July might not matter as much as what your collective is going to bring to the table at the last second. Or, you know, I don't know if necessarily all these programs anymore want to want to waste their time or invest their time in player development when they can just go get these guys out some, of the, yeah. off the transfer wire in a couple of years. Purdue is going to keep doing what Purdue's always done. And they're going to bank on continuity mattering and they're they're going to build on they're going to bank on team chemistry built over time mattering and it's going to be a a kind of an interesting case study in which philosophy is the best way to do things kind of moving forward because a lot of these schools they're just playing different sports now um yeah you you have a lot of teams that are just uh buying players out of the transfer portal um I try not to use the word portal and I just slipped up. Yeah. Probably the first time I said it in months. Anyway, um what word are you using for? Transfer wire, transfer market. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, All right. All right. You're good. Transfer landscape. Yeah. Um so you have a lot of programs out there who are just content to go buy 23-year-olds off the transfer wire. Um there you and go. then you have some programs who are still investing in the 18 19 year old who you got to put some time into to get their best um and you know you hope that at some point in time you get to that place where you have a good core that has played a lot of basketball together and that's where purdue is right now that they've got this really good core that's played a lot of good basketball together um but it is a game increasingly played by grown men. And, uh, you know, Purdue does have a grown man on its team right now who happens to be the returning national player of the year. And um, uh, that shouldn't be an issue this year. But kind of moving forward, you're going to see Purdue run out teams of of a lot of high school recruits playing against a lot of mercenaries. Uh, but that that's not new. I mean, when Purdue played Illinois a couple of years ago, Illinois' average age of its starting lineup was like 22. And, you know, Purdue was out there with a bunch of uh, uh, 19 and 20 and 21 year olds. Yeah, big, big, uh, uh, big difference. And in, in you're right, the landscape is uh, not necessarily um, Purdue's going to be a little bit of an outlier, maybe down the road with that. But uh, it is a culture that seems to work. OK, last question. And Miles Coleman, we've talked about uh, uh, just his need for development and obviously he's you know, I know he's played as of this recording in a, in a couple games in terms of uh, I think he's played in three games uh, with respect to the USA basketball uh, or the under U19 basketball I should say at the five of World Cup just talk about that that and maybe what that development can mean for him and then obviously getting the chance to get back here and start to really uh, hone in on his freshman year in West Lafayette yeah you know it's kind of a kind of a complicated topic because yeah like if you ask Purdue what would you prefer for Miles Colvin to make that team or Miles Colvin to be here practicing they would say they'd like him to make that team because that's a big deal it's a big deal it's a really big deal it's a great experience but you kind of think about it for a second and be like well they're, they're going to fast track this guy to the floor and this will be the the highest level of competition, the highest level of coaching he's ever gotten. And all that practice he's missing is, you know, not ideal. Uh, that said, you do not ever turn your nose up at these USA basketball events. They're a big deal. Purdue has so much respect for the basketball community at large that you would never, ever um, call this something other than what it is, which is a really big honor for, for Miles Colvin. That said, they need to get him up to speed. They need to get him here, uh, and <laughs> they need to get him acclimated to college structure. They need to get him acclimated to college defensive structure more than anything. They need to get him acclimated to this competitive environment here. That said, this USA basketball experience will be the highest level of competition he's played in his basketball career. Most likely, it'll be the best players he's ever played with. It'll probably be the best players he's ever played against. Um, you know, Tad Boyle's a good coach. Um, yeah. I'm sure that will be a good experience for him. Um, but I think just in terms of setting a competitive tone for his college basketball career, I think that that's where the real the real benefit of this can come. I think that uh, um, it's just something where this is 
obviously this is a situation where winning and losing really matters. Um, you know, outside of maybe some sectional games uh, in his high school career, I'm not sure he ever played in games where the stakes were all that high. Now he's been at, at, at certain events. He's been in like the IBCA top 100 event where he yeah. played great. The first time I saw him there, he was the best player in that gym. If you ask me and, um, you know, he's played at NBA camp. He's, he's played in some really good competitive environments, but I think this is, this is his first opportunity to be on a really good team. And I think that'll set a good, uh, a good tone for his college basketball career competitively because everything changes for him when he gets to Purdue. Um, you know, he, he's going to have to change to be part of Purdue more than Purdue is going to have to change to acclimate him, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I think he is so talented. I think they just need to get him up to speed as fast as possible. And they need to get him on the floor. They need to get him experience and they need to have him at the highest level they can get him come the end of the season and kind of things like that. Uh, Cause he's, I think he's that level of talent. Miles Colvin is playing U19. He won't even turn 18 until uh, he's somewhere in Europe with Purdue on the 9th of August. So there's a young talent that has got a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, exciting things ahead for him. So it'll be interesting that's, to see. you know, those first couple of days of practice for him at Purdue could be a complete train wreck <laughs> because look, he's over in where now Hungary. Yeah. So he's going to go from the United States to Hungary, come back, and then he's going to basically get to Purdue. He's going to practice for a couple of weeks, and then he's going to get on a plane and he's going to go, you know, to all these other places with Purdue. Uh, we talked about cannon catchings before, and right? all that demands on him. How many time zones is he going to cross this summer? Oh yeah, um, and that's not something that guys that age are necessarily used to, especially you know Miles Colvin having not. You know, he, he's done USA basketball stuff. So he's he's, yeah. he's been part of that feeder program. So he's a little more acclimated to the back and forth and, you know, the altitude out there and kind of things like that. Um, but um, that takes a, that could take a pretty big physical toll on, on, on a kid when they're not used to it. You know, if this were Caleb first, like Caleb first was, you know, a guy as an eighth grader, everybody knew who he was. He was going to all these events. He was used to the travel kind of the back and forth. I don't know if you're ever used to it though. It's yeah, like when I try and I'm an old man now, but when I get done with the basketball season, uh, all the travel that it entails, I'm just, I'm just wiped. Uh, granted I'm an old man, not a, 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 uh, 17, almost 18 year old. Correct. Yeah. Um, I'm not a uh, energetic young greenhorn like these guys are. Um, I am an old, old man. Um, but <laughs> it takes a toll on you, especially yeah. when, when you have to have energy and you have to have your legs under you to play at a really high competitive level. And the guys you're playing against are really good. And they've not, you know, been subject to the same, to the same things. Um it's it's going to be interesting to see how Miles Colvin is come you know September October in practice. Uh, you would think he'd get his legs back under him by then, but those first couple of days back after that Europe trip with Purdue could be uh, could be a little bit uh, sketchy. Yeah, no doubt. All right, you're going to get a chance if you're a Purdue fan to see Miles on uh, August 5th, I believe it is. Uh, they'll be having a, a inter squad scrimmage as part of a basketball reunion. Colvin and company and the Boilermakers will be headed to Europe where they'll play in France, Italy, Germany, and I believe Switzerland. I think they're four or five games uh, in a relatively uh, quick trip in August. So, Brian, Let me say thank one you. other thing about yeah, Miles Colvin ahead. here. Yes, go ahead. When he gets to Purdue, he is going to be the only scholarship freshman. So he is going to be the guy on the floor who knows the least about what he's doing. So he is going to be the guy that coaches are always harping on. They're always, you know, oftentimes yelling at, <laughs> and that's going to be a test of his, of his, you know, approach to all this too. That's going to be a test of his, 
I don't want to say maturity because that, that's kind of a loaded term, but I remember when Carson Edwards showed up at Purdue, he was in the same boat. He was the only scholarship freshman and they were yelling at him all the time. And he took that kind of personally and they had to explain to him, Hey, we need to get you ready to go here. Uh, so we're, we're really, uh, we're really um, kind of harping on you for that reason. They went overseas. He ended up having a great freshman year. Colvin needs is going to need to understand that when they're jumping on him um, over over defensive details, it's not personal. It's not. It, it's a compliment more than anything, and you know, uh, I, I I think that's going to you know be part of his his early uh, Purdue career story too when he gets here and he actually gets to practice yeah no question no question all right brian thanks uh safe travels we'll look forward to your reporting from uh the southeast or okay whatever you call north carolina though i guess uh you'll be uh you'll be what in charlotte first and then of course it in uh in now but wait is is the Augusta in Georgia or the South Carolina version of, of Augusta? Well, it's North Augusta, South Carolina. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Uh, so what... so it, it's right across the river from Augusta. Yeah. It's literally, you could walk from downtown Augusta to uh, North Augusta, South Carolina. Yeah. Hometown of uh, former Purdue swimming coach, Dan Ross. From, I just found out. So now North not... Augusta, South Carolina. I did not know that. I, did well, not know I didn't that. either. I, I don't know how I found that out. Dan, one of the great, one of the great guys, and uh, kind of the the last of the old time coaches uh, that uh, just uh, retired this year. Uh, always been uh, a breath of fresh air to talk to about just about anything. I didn't want to talk, talk to him about swimming because I didn't know anything, but I did. Uh, <laughs> but he talks. He's a good sports guy and a lot of different things, and is uh, a Purdue legend of sorts. All right, we will take a. We'll, we'll transition. We're going to talk a little football with Tom Deanhart as well on the back end of this. Brian, safe travels. Goldenblack.com is your source for Purdue sports, but also don't forget that uh, you can subscribe to our uh, us at, through at Goldenblack.com. Some specials going on currently, uh, and we appreciate the thousands of folks that have already done so. All right, Brian, have a great trip, and uh, we will talk again probably before then, but on Saturday simulcast here in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Tom Dienard joins us uh, for Saturday simulcast and uh, obviously an extremely busy month uh, for uh, Purdue football recruiting and maybe as productive a month as I can remember in a long time, or certainly a month of June. Nine commitments, if I'm counting right, Tom, and and uh, two or three, four, two four stars in there. But, uh, you know, now that we're at the end of the month uh, and there'll still be more to come, just kind of wrap that up. And I don't know if there's a way to put a bow on this, but uh, how to – how do you uh, summarize what went all, all went on over the last few weeks? Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's been a busy uh, it's been a busy June, like you said. Nine commitments. Uh, by the time people watch this, maybe there's a tenth. So yeah, we'll have to just wait and see. But yeah, just you know, they've uh, June's typically a pretty busy month. I think Brom got seven commitments last June, so it's a chance for guys you know take a lot of official visits in June and. And then guys make decisions and <clears throat> July heads and heads into a dead period. So yeah, um, yeah, so far so good. You know, the early returns, if you believe the rankings, you know, say Purdue's doing a pretty good job. I think on three's got them uh 25th in the country and sixth in the Big Ten. So uh, a lot of very good defensive backs. You know, they got their quarterback, they have their running back. Um, so yeah, and they've got a nice spread of guys. They've still got several needs, of course, but uh, some pretty uh, high-profile guys uh, thus far, too. I think the highest, according to the on three rankings, as far as uh, ratings go, the highest-rated commit is Coy Beasley, the the athlete that they got from LaSalle High School in Cincinnati recently, uh, um, a guy who could play either side of the ball, um, listed as a cornerback by most services, but I think they've talked to Coy, and, and you know, like they, they, they've told him that hey, if, if something works out on offense, you certainly can play over there as well, and he's going to get a chance to to run back kicks. Very fast player. And then Marcos Deville, the quarterback, is probably the second highest rated guy. And they're, they're running back Jaheim Merriweather, 
is rated pretty highly by on three two. So they've got a nice start. Some uh, uh, just some nice talented guys thus far in this this class, which numbers sixteen as we record this. Yeah, you know what's interesting that uh, really from different places. I know Purdue over the years has gone to different. You know, the back way back in the day it was Chicago and maybe a little more Midwest focused. But Purdue's done well in Florida and Texas. Joe Tiller did a lot with that. But this is also another class that's. You know, you got uh, Max Parrott from Colorado. You've got uh, guys from Texas, Florida, uh, Tennessee. Of course, you talk about Merriweather from Knoxville, a four-star guy. Um, mm-hmm. Really an interesting uh, group of folks. I mean, it's been uh, – uh, what do you think that's as much a sign of? Obviously, they've got some, got some good ties in the St. Louis area, et cetera. But how do you, how do you tie that together and what, uh, uh, what do you attribute that to? Is that just the nature of uh, the recruiting world these days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You typically go where where you've got your connections, and sure. obviously Purdue wants to you know have a Midwestern footprint. Um, that's always going to be the case, and you know a lot of these guys on the staff were obviously on the Illinois staff, so they've got connections in Chicago. And you'll see, I think this staff hit Chicago harder than the uh, than the former staff did. So yeah. they've had some guys in to visit in the Chicago area, and they got the one commitment so far, actually one of their best commitments of this class. You know, Luke Williams, the the safety they got a couple of weeks or so ago, a very, very highly touted guy from, from Naperville. And then, you know, they've got some connections. I know over in western Missouri, you mentioned St. Louis as well. Deep ties into Texas with this with these staffers, you know, especially Graham Harrell, I know, leading the way down there. And down into Florida, too. Um uh, I know Brick Haley and some of the other assistant coaches have some deep connections down there. So, you know, then you're going to get the, the, I guess, the outlier, like the kid from Colorado every once in a while. And, uh, of course, it's funny. He goes to Max Parrott goes to the rival high school for Ryan Walters. Max Parrott goes to Cherry Creek High School. And uh, and, and Ryan Walters played at, at a school called Grandview. So they were rivals, high schools, and they had some fun with that during the recruiting process. And I was trying to think, I was talking to Max Parrott, the last uh, the last time Purdue had a player from Colorado, they had a running back in the early '90s, I think, from Colorado, from Denver. But I, I couldn't recall the last uh, the last football player Purdue recruited and, and signed from the state of Colorado. Yeah, but because I, I listened to your interview with Max and and uh, sounded like a sharp guy, and it was funny how they were. He was taking some flack from Ryan Walters on that. Yeah, we're gonna. We'll look that up because I actually did a long time ago, did a breakdown by state. It's not okay. been totally updated. And I'm trying to think of who you're thinking of from Colorado. Well, I say, some reason I want to say his last name is Morrow. He was a running Well, Galen back. Morrow, maybe. Yeah, I think, I think you know, he, he played under, I believe he played under Joe, uh, not uh, under Jim Coletto. Maybe he was even a Fred Akers recruit. Um, but he was running back from uh I want to say it was Mullen High, but yeah, well, I'll have to look that up. But I couldn't recall. Well, you are, you're you're pulling one out. Yeah, that is pretty dang good. <laughs> I think you're right, though. Now that I think about it, yeah, I couldn't. Think get- of course, one of Purdue's greatest basketball players ever is from Den- Denver, Colorado. We know that, Alan. Yeah, Joe Barry Carroll certainly, and uh, uh, you're right. I think in, in uh, just looking, doing a quick search, I think that Galen Morrow was was. Uh, from uh, from the Colorado area, but it is rare uh, that uh, yeah. Purdue's got gets folks. No, you know, there, 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 there's just not a lot of. There's probably ten to twelve legitimate recruitable guys in that state every year, and most yeah. are probably stay out that way. So, I'm sure Ryan Walters' connections to that area helped at least get him in the door. And it seems like Alan, once this staff gets guys on campus, you know, it's almost like deal closed. You know. Yeah. Um, it's like a, just like any other business, right? You got to get people into the shop if you want to make yeah. a sale. You got to get foot traffic in the door, and then if these guys get foot traffic in the door. Seems like they can they can they can close and and seal the deal on a lot of these guys. It's been impressive. Yeah, Tom, you always impressive. You are Galen Morrow, two touchdowns, forty nine rushes in nineteen ninety. So he was recruited by Fred yeah. Akers. Fred Akers, Fred Akers, and then 92, he got a few carriers there for Jim yeah, Coletto in Coletto. I think, it was, yeah, I think it was Mullen High School for some reason, M-U-L-L. Yeah. But I don't have all my media guides here. to. to <laughs> yeah, I, I got all of them at home. I love the – when I get bored, Alan. <laughs> yeah, I know. I used to study those things and, and remember, but, but uh, I think you're right as well. But, you know, the whole notion that uh, – 
uh, you've written about this and talked about this certainly even with Kyle on our on our Golden Black Radio on Fridays or excuse me on Mondays. Um, just the bells and whistles that they've brought, and the, and, the, and maybe it's a pizzazz, it's a it's a quiet, quiet, or maybe it's not so quiet confidence. And you know, we're going to show what we have to offer. Put bring an indie car to the to yeah. the uh, uh, concourse of Ross Aid Stadium, making a big deal out of Purdue's uh, uh, aeronautics school and doing a lot out at the airport. You got to give them credit for go, going with your strengths, you know, and and certainly yeah. Purdue is known academically. I can't think if there are all that many students outside of outside of Markel Jones and Tony Jones that ever flew for a living. And, and, and I know there are others. There aren't many, though. My point is you, you, you sell the sizzle there uh, mm-hmm. as much as the steak. And it seems like this this group has really done a good job. This group being Ryan Walter's staff has good. And it seems to be having some fun with it, too. Yeah, they've tried to brand each side of the ball, you know, air raid for the offensive <laughs> side and then air strike for the defensive side and, and kind of build off those brands. When, and we've seen that in a lot of their social media impressions. And when they when they send out tweets, when there's looming commitments yeah, <laughs> references, you see hashtag references and other visual images to airstrike and air raid. So, yeah, they try to, you know, you got you to have an identity in life, right? Um, what are you, Alan Carpet? You got to ask yourself, whatever you are as an organization, what are you? And, and you got to you got to come up with that, I guess, mission statement or branding. And, and so people know, hey, this is Purdue. Oh, yeah, you guys are this school. And uh, I think I think it, it's got to help at least give people recruits specifically an idea of what the, of what they want to do on both sides of the ball. Then they can sell their, their vision schematically when they get, get kids on campus. And I think it's a fun experience for them, Alan. It must be when they get them here. Yeah. And it goes beyond just the coaches. I think the players are obviously are actively involved as well. Um, I had one kid tell me uh, about taking a scooter ride with, with Brock Thompson. <laughs> and that was kind of a really the, one of the things that helped seal the deal for him. They, they rode around campus and, talked and and uh just a chance to to really get the skinny from one of your peers you know alan it's one thing to have a, an older person sell you something but when you have somebody who's your peer that's been walking the walk and doing the deal at least for a few months on the staff you know that, that that's, that's even a stronger sales pitch i think so yeah you know this has been a, an effort that's gone like i said from the roster all the way up to probably a lot of people in the athletic department, including Tiffany Grimes, um, that are all involved in, in trying to get these guys on the campus and sell their their vision of Purdue. Yeah, I don't think there's any question that they, I mean, uh, and it never has player personnel been more in focus than it has been probably in the last two years with the transfer portal, but also recruiting. And yet uh, uh, there it's clear what these guys are about. Yeah. Some other names to look at uh, Trey Mar Harris, by the time this is recorded yeah. may have made his choice. Uh, and we also William speedy nettles love that yeah. name from Dallas to uh, Christian school in Dallas, Texas uh, may also announce around July the 4th. So keep your, keep your uh, eyes peeled to goldenblack.com. A couple uh, other guys too, Al. And I think yeah. July 1st, a couple guys are supposed to make announcements. John Randall, yeah. an offensive lineman from Mississippi, uh, and Elijah Groves. He's, he, they're recruiting him as an inside linebacker, a kid from Tennessee. Both those guys decide July 1st, which is Saturday. And um, I guess I would lean to believe that those guys are – are heavily in Purdue's camp. We'll, we'll see if officially they make that proclamation come Saturday. But I would, I would, I would characterize those guys as Purdue lean. So again, Traymar Harris, John Randall, Elijah Groves are the guys that seem to be on deck as far as next to make announcements. And then later in July, keep an eye on Jamari Payne, uh, sort of an outside linebacker from from Auburn, Alabama. He's a guy I think is a Purdue lean as well. You talked about Speedy Nettles. Being maybe around July fourth, he's going to announce too. Uh, so yeah, there, it, it could be a pretty active, you know, next seven to ten days for Purdue. And this class could could leap into the twenty commitments level here real soon. Yeah, you listed on the site. Uh, I think on Friday by position uh, what uh, Purdue was missing, and not necessarily. And you know this a heck of a lot more than I do what they're looking for. But no tight ends, no nose tackles yet. 
inside linebacker we'd mentioned uh, is a guy that there's a guy that right out there it's possible an outside linebacker positions where Purdue uh, will f- may or may not depending on yeah. need fill in this class but you know you look at that in in four and right now four defensive backs if you look at safeties and cornerbacks slash safeties mm-hmm. in this class but you as you've said many times before it is not a, unexpected that uh, Ryan Walter should be able to be be in get uh, in good with the top flight to uh, DBs and and it seems like that's already the case yeah I mean looking I'm looking at the I pinned to the message board the very top of the message board for people that are sort of a sort of a breakdown of the, of the class as it's being put together, the commitments. And then also below that is sort of a list of the positions that have been filled and, and where the, each player projects to play. And yeah, you know, um, defensive backs, my gosh, that's, there's five right now, Alan. And yeah. that's not including Corey Beasley, who I'm listing as an athlete. So as you can see, uh, uh, a nice collection of defensive backs, some pretty highly thought of guys, Earl Culp's a kid from St. Thomas Aquinas in Fort Lauderdale. A big time guy like Coy Beasley, like Luke Williams, so real heavy on the DB so far. Um, yeah, we talked talk, the linebacker spot is void right now, inside and outside, uh, and tight end as well. Um, they're on a kid who who just recently decommitted from Texas Tech. Um, he may be leaning towards Oklahoma, but I know Purdue's involved with him as well. So tight end's a spot that that still needs to be filled. They'd like to get, get at least one tight end. I know. I know they're finished at quarterback and running back. I could see, you know, another receiver or so too. So, yeah, there's a uh, and then th- th- Alan, they're just never going to turn down a talent a player, no matter how many guys they already got at a certain position. You'd be, you'd be kind of foolish to do that. So, um, yeah, it's going to be fun to see how this thing finishes up here. A long way to go, and uh, transfer portal too, Alan. Um, we all expect. Uh, this this big interior lineman from Colorado to come to Purdue in July, a kid named Austin Johnson, once he finishes up schoolwork in Boulder. And Purdue also has begun to, I guess you could say, kick the tires on, on, on a big offensive tackle who just went in the portal on June 28th, the kid from Oklahoma um, named Aaron Park. So, you know, we'll see if Purdue can get really involved with that kid or not, but I know they're at least trying to vet the situation, see what his interest is, see why he's leaving OU, and maybe and may, maybe there's a relationship that develops there too. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, uh makes this, uh, in your line of work, uh, uh, frazzling at times because it's coming at you fast, but it is – it is a it is really really interesting from the player personnel standpoint because uh, the you know I and, and it's funny because you're right they are sixth in the league and that includes USC in that mix and and uh, I don't remember a first year coach uh, certainly since the rankings have come out now you know and it, yeah. it's hard to compare exactly but uh, that's impressive too a lot of times the guys you know even going all the way back to Fred Akers. Uh, to some extent, uh, even uh, even Danny Hope in year two uh, did better. But uh, it's impressive to hit the ground running. And I know the world's yeah. very different. But the fact that uh, that he's been able to do this, uh, he being Ryan Walters and staff, uh, really adds to that intrigue of uh, what Purdue may see, at least from a player personnel standpoint, uh, over the first few years of the Walters regime. Yeah, yeah. They, they haven't played a game yet. And uh, he's been able to sell his vision and, and- and uh, gets a pretty impressive recruits four four stars at least on three dot com four stars. Alan, we've talked yeah. about. I think Davila, the quarterback, um, Keonde Henry, he's a wide receiver, yeah. flip from Boston College. Talked about Coy Beasley, and then the running back Jaheim Merriweather. So four four star guys as rated by on three, and the kicker they got Spencer Porath. Yeah, well, he doesn't have a star rating, but he's considered the best kicker in Indiana, and I think the ninth best kicker in America, according to this organization called Coles Kicking, which is I think one of the more respected kicking organizations uh, and kicking camps in America. So he's another guy who comes with a pretty nice resume too. And Luke Williams, Alan, you know, on three only has him as a three star, but I know a lot yeah. of people have him as a four star. So on and on it goes. Just a nice collection of guys. He got some in-state guys too. You always like doing well in your own state. And, uh, yeah, I mean, fans, I think fans have been tickled pink here watching this staff work and and, and, and and sort of looking at some of the commitments they've been able to get early on. Yeah, I understand that I have, you know, technically it's true. Ryan Walters did sign to have a class 
that uh, committed after, but about less than a week after, or signed, I should say, less than a week after he took the job at Purdue. Uh, but uh, again, when you go back to look at the when February was a signing date and coaches, uh, uh, the fact that uh, he's this is really his first year, it's really impressive from that standpoint. All right, man, we'll let you go. And uh, uh, I know you're going to get ready for your fireworks uh, show oh, yeah. here before long uh, as well. We appreciate uh, all that you've done. Uh, keeping us up to date with this great stuff and really good. I really enjoyed the interviews too. If you haven't had a chance to check those out, the ones that uh, Tom's been able to do with some of the commitments uh, here the last uh, short period of time, really insightful, the kind of kids Purdue's getting. And uh, if you're a Purdue fan, I think you need to be encouraged from that standpoint. We'll see how they are when they get on the field. I get that. Uh, but uh, I'm not being skeptical about them just saying, we'll see. Yes, sir. What, what also do one last thing. I confirmed this week that training camp is going to start August 1st. It's a right. Tuesday. So that's, you know, we're about a month away from training camp starting. So they'll be out there sweating away in the, uh, the West Lafayette, August heater before you know it, getting ready for September 2nd. I've talked to Bobinski this week. He says the project, everything in the stadium is still on track. You know, we know the nutrition center is not going to be ready. We always knew that. Yeah. But that has nothing to do with game day. But, yeah, he says it's still all systems go, the tunnel, the south end zone. So, it's been plenty dry for them to work, right? So, uh, yeah, we all sit here eagerly waiting and and uh, let all types of, of, of visions of grandeur run through our heads <laughs> what this season, season could look like. You know, yeah, I was going to say, the, the lights don't blind you just a few blocks where you are from uh, from uh, Ross Aid Stadium, but they're it. on they're on all <laughs> night, night long yeah. Uh, yeah, they because uh, they're working hard to get that done. I thought that was interesting and obviously you also had a good tidbit about uh, uh the john purdue club meeting and and uh, kind of a meeting of the minds out in wyoming with mike babinski and uh, yeah Drew i think it's just a Drew chance Wilson. you know it's a chance for him to kind of connect with some of the donors and get yeah. feedback i don't think it's a real big sales pitch al i think it is one of it's more of a meet and greet and a chance yeah. for people to, to kind of get brought up to speed with what some of the athletic department's visions are i believe so yeah, Mike's a busy guy, and July's a month where things will slow down a little bit. A lot of vacations, the football coaches will be gone, and one of the few few little windows here for, for them to sort of check out for a couple of weeks before everything gets hot and heavy, like I said, and, and, and into late July. Because late July, Alan, there's, of course, Big Ten Media Day, and that'll ramp up like July 26, 27. So and then, I, then I talked about training camp. So so, yeah, the recruiting slows down as far as visits go and all that. And coaches will have uh, some some downtime, too. And, and again, it's going to get busy here, though, real quickly after that, though, in August. All right. Sounds good. Well, uh, again, thanks for everything. And we want to thank the Union Club Hotel uh, for their sponsorship of Saturday Simulcast. As a reminder, you can subscribe to goldenblack.com. Uh, we've got some specials going on right now. Uh, in addition to, there'll probably be some more as we head into training camp too. Uh, it's the money well spent to, to to get all of Tom's and Brian's work and our work here at uh, goldenblack.com. And uh, also make sure that you subscribe. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, leave comments, like us, do everything you can do to help us along. But uh, we appreciate that. So have a great weekend, everybody. And uh, we'll look forward to more of our Saturday simulcast throughout the summer. And uh, uh, be safe on the, the 4th of July when we get to that next week.